um, have some kind of interest in the United States, whether that interest is inbound, which is predominantly 85% of my clients are outside the US and have inbound issues into the US. And then smaller segment of my clients, 15% or so are Americans that have interest outside the US. Um, so anyways, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Um, and I also appreciate the opportunity to put on a suit. Um, I've been working out of my home office for, this is now day seven. So it was kind of nice to put on a suit this morning and uh, feel like I'm a lawyer today. So I appreciate that as well. So let's kick this off. And um, I know I'm on the last session of the day, so I'll try and make this as painless as possible, especially as we're talking about um, US tax co um, concepts, but let's start. So I think we'll start with um, the fundamentals of US tax for Russian nationals. Um, and I, this is gonna be a very quick, quick, quick overview um, because we could spend you know, 30 minutes of, in of itself talking about this. But um, this, this, this information will be a good foundation for some of the structuring that we'll talk about in, in a few minutes. But basically as a, as a Russian, as a, as a wealthy Russian national, you know, how are you taxed in the United States for income tax, um, for income tax, from an income tax perspective? And so Russians that are investing in the United States or have assets in the United States, there's really two bases to be taxed, uh, to enter the federal income tax uh, system. One is um, if there's an active trader business. So if a Russian's invested in an active trader business here in the United States, um, whether that be, you know, manufacturing, um, can be real estate for a reason I'll, we'll talk about in a second. Um, they will be taxed on, on a net basis. Um, so basically gross income, less deductions, whatever income, the net income will be taxed um, here in the United States at, at different rates, depending upon how that Russian invests, whether through a corporation or individually. Um, but that, that, that kind of activity will definitely be taxed and subject to income tax in the United States. Um, an important exclusion to that, and it's, and it's an exclusion that a lot of my clients, my foreign clients, including Russian clients, avail of, is they're, um, they are not taxed on capital gains. So that's a really important exclusion for um, Russian nationals. So Russian nationals that are in the stock market, although hopefully not in the stock market now, <laughs> given how terrible it is, but um, in the stock market, other types of investments, private equity, um, hedge investments, the gain, the cap, the gains and in income they generate on those types of investments are what we call capital gain, and capital gain earned in the hands of foreign um, individuals like Russians is not subject to U.S. federal income tax. So it's a, a huge, huge and very important exclusion. Um, now, of course, the exclusion has its own exclusion, and that exclusion is for real estate. Um, so real estate, even though gains from the sale of real estate um, would ordinarily be capital gain. Um, and, and under the general rule for foreigners earning capital gain, um, it wouldn't be taxable. There's an exception that says for foreigners who invest in U.S. real estate, which is a very popular asset class um, for foreign investors, um, that, that, is, that, is, that those gains are ECI. They are not subject to the exclusion um, of taxation for capital gains, meaning that essentially um, gains on the sale of real estate, even if held by foreigners, are subject to U.S. income tax. Um, other, the other class of income that's subject to tax here in the U.S. when held by uh, foreign individuals or foreign structures would be passive income. So income from dividends, um, from dividends on U.S. stock, interest on U.S. debt, uh, royalties, and then um, rental income. So that type of income is subject to, it's not, it's not subject to tax on a net basis like active trade or business income, but it's subject to withholding tax. So a, a gross withholding tax of generally 30% which is subject to reduction um, by tax treaty. Um, and luckily there is a tax treaty between Russia and the United States. So there is an opportunity to lower some of those rates. Um, one important thing to say about that, I mean, those, the, the, those withholding taxes are kind of are what they are. Um, but for rental income, there is an election. And, and because real estate, it's such a common investment for, for my foreign clients coming into the US. Um, there's an election to treat rental income to tax it on a net basis. So you're not subject to 30% gross withholding. Instead, you can be taxed on a net basis. So basically, you get to get the you get to take advantage of things like 
depreciation, interest, and the expenses of the property to basically lower um, the tax base. So most clients of mine that are investing in real estate in the United States, um, most foreign clients are, are, are taking advantage of that net election so that they end up paying less U.S. tax. Um, so that's a quick, quick overview of income taxation for um, Russian nationals. Um, the next slide talks about transfer taxation. So in addition to the federal income tax regime here in the United States, um, we also have a transfer tax regime, which, is, which can be very onerous. So the transfer tax regime comes in the estate tax, so a tax that um, applies when someone dies holding U.S. assets, or a gift tax. So basically someone during life wants to gift assets that are located in the U.S. to others, um, and those gifts will attract gift tax. The general rate for um, estate and gift tax here in the U.S. is 40%, so it's, an, it's a very high rate tax. And it, it applies on a gross basis. So um, when someone dies holding a U.S. CITES asset, if it's not properly structured, 40% um, of that, the fair market value of that asset is due in, in estate tax. And gift tax operates the same way. So when I have Russian clients or really any foreign client um, owning assets in the US, whether it be investment assets, um, whether it be personal use assets like a condo in New York that they spend time in, um, I'm always careful to make sure that we structure, um, we structure that asset in a manner where we, we're not subject to federal estate and gift tax, given the fact that it's such a high um, confiscatory tax. I mean, essentially, at the bottom of this slide, there's an example that if a non-U.S. individual holds um, a parcel of U.S. real estate, let's just say it's a condominium in New York that they spend time in, and it's five million sixty thousand dollar fair market value, and dies hold, holding it individually, um, that person's estate is going to have a two million dollar tax bill due to the federal government um, as a result of that death. Um, so, and the exemption. There's a small exemption for foreign, for foreign individuals um, investing in U.S. assets, but it's only $60,000. So for you know, all of my clients, that, it's, it's a pittance compared to what they're, what they're investing in the U.S. And then an another important thing to note on this is in addition to real estate, um, U.S. CITES assets include um, security. So unbeknownst to a lot of people um, and, and my clients as well, and when they come in the door, um, they could have huge portfolio accounts with U.S. investment advisors at Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America. Um, how have U.S. stocks, and they hold them in their individual name, and those those assets are also subject to um, the estate tax regime. Meaning that if they die holding those stocks and bonds and you know the securities in their individual name, when they die, forty percent of the value of those of, of that portfolio. Will, be need to, will need to be paid to the US government in a state tax. So the good news is that there's, um, there are tools, which we'll talk about later, um, that we can easily use to block um, a, a Russian national's exposure to those taxes. They just need to be put in place before we make the investment. And then quickly, um, so those are the rules that apply to Russian nationals. Now, I have clients, um, amazingly, that still want to get green cards and want to become U.S. citizens um, and want to live here um, for a long time, you know, for a long period during each year. And so those, those clients face becoming fully income tax and estate tax resident. And what that means is, is for a foreign client who gets a green card, who becomes a citizen, or ends up spending too much time in the United States in any given year, and, and, we'll, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, they become subject to tax on a worldwide basis. So the United States will tax, will impose income tax on those clients um, on their worldwide income. So we do not have a territorial income tax system. So me as a U.S. citizen, if I, if I have an investment, if I, if I was living in the Cayman Islands and had an investment in, um, in China, and made a billion dollars in that investment, the United States would still tax that billion dollar a gain, whether most countries, that's not the case. Um, so it's very important for people who are, who, you know, for clients that want to get a green card, that want to become a citizen, or that want to spend a lot of time in the United States, that they understand 
that that's, that's the potential downfall um, of becoming tax resident. And then similarly, um, Russian, Russian nationals who end up living in the United States, so they live here, and then have a intent to permanently reside here, even if they can't, uh, if they're here illegally. Um, but if, they're, they're, if their subjective intent was to live here permanently, and they are in fact here, they are subject to a state and gift tax on a worldwide basis, meaning that if they were to die um, while um, being living here and having the intent to stay here, um, the Uncle Sam would impose an estate tax of 40% on all their worldwide assets, including the assets in Russia, including the assets in China, no matter where in the world. So those are big, um, important tax issues that need to be addressed before someone um, immigrates to the U.S. or spends a lot of time in the U.S. And so the next slide, and this is just something to be aware of as you advise um, clients that might touch the United States or you might not remember these rules, but just the things that you can jog in your mind when you're talking to them that, you know, wow, the U.S. has this worldwide tax system and you have to be really careful as to how much time you spend in the U.S. and what you do. And if you're not going to be careful, we need to plan, plan for, um, for that, for, for, for you to get income tax residency and, and hopefully minimize your tax burden once you get here. Um, but again, it's, it's kind of we talked about briefly. Um, to become an income tax resident, to have, to have a Russian client become an income tax resident of the United States, really one of three things needs to happen. One, they get citizenship. That automatically brings them into um, full income tax resident of the United States. Two, green card. So they get a green card under EB-5 or some program where they get a green card, the, you know, the lottery. Once they get the green card, um, great to have the green card, great to have, have the ability to permanently reside in the U.S. The problem is that person's now fully um, U.S. income tax resident on a worldwide basis. The third way to do it is something we call the substantial presence test, and it's in this slide that I've got on the screen. It's, it's the middle bullet point. And basically, this is what, what we call the day count test. And what it, what, what, it, what it does is if you spend too many days in the U.S. based on a formula in any year, um, for that year, you'll be treated as a worldwide income tax resident. And so clients, Russian clients, um, European clients, whatever clients, when they're coming here and spending time in the U.S., and we, that time is going to be material, um, we are laser focused in making sure that they, we monitor the number of days that person staying in the U.S. to make sure that they don't trip up in this rule. Um, and if they, we think they are going to trip into this rule, we plan to make sure that effectively we, we minimize their um, tax, their U.S. tax liability. So the way the, the test works, um, basically, if you're here for 180, if you have a client or you're an individual or you're here for 183 days or more in any year, you're going to be fully income tax resident in the United States on a worldwide basis for that year. So 183 days, it's a certainty. Um, if you're less than 183 days in a year, what happens is you, when you, there's a calculation, and it's on this slide. It's effectively you take all the days in the current year, then you take a third of the days in the year prior, and then the sixth of the days of the year prior to that, you add them up, and if that number is 183 or more, then for that year you do that, for the year that you're doing that calculation, your client is fully um, U.S. income tax resident. Um, so has to pay income tax on a worldwide basis on worldwide gain. And so um, if you wanted to maximize the number of days your client or you stayed in the United States every year, say I want to max out the number of days but not violate this test, I don't want to become U.S. income tax um, resident, the number of days is effectively 122. You, you can spend 122 days each year and not violate that test. Um, and there are exceptions if you end up violating the test, um, like a, a closer connection ex exemption, probably beyond the, the scope of what we want to talk about today, but um, it's out there. Um, the state tax, like we talked about before, purely, it's, it's, it's much more subjective. There's no you know, day count test for that. It's purely subjective. Are, is your client physically present in the U.S., and is there, is there an intent to permanently reside in the U.S. at that point? So much more subjective. So um, with, that, with that kind of very base background, let's, let's get into some U.S. planning and structuring opportunities for Russian nationals. And by the way, I, I'm throwing a lot of information, 
So I'm gonna leave some time for questions at the end. So um, please, if you have questions on any of this as I'm going through it, um, note them and then we can revisit um, at the end of the presentation. So planning opportunities for Russian nationals. So basically when I have Russian clients come to me with US tax issues, um, there are some common situations that come up and, and there's obviously ones that aren't so common, but the ones I see most are, you know, kids, you know, so the kids coming to the U.S. for education, for college, um, you have an F visa, end up, you know, marrying someone here or wanting to stay here to work. And so that child shifts from being um, on, under an F visa, so not subject to U.S. tax on a worldwide basis, to getting some kind of visa category where they will be subject to U.S. tax on a worldwide basis. And then dealing with the issues of, you know, the family has a pristine, beautiful, wealth succession trust structure outside the U.S., but what do we do now that we have a U.S. taxpayer who's going to benefit from that structure, and how can we make, the, uh, make it efficient from a U.S. tax perspective? So that's one issue that comes up frequently. Second one is diversification in an unstable world. So clients that are looking to use the United States um, as, as, a, as, an, as a place to invest, as a place to hold assets, as a place to have trusts. And the, the opportunity is to use the legal framework, so the, the rule of law in the United States, the, um, the court system in the United States, the trust law in the United States to protect family assets, um, to use that as a base to, um, to avail of US investment opportunities, and then to gain some asset protection benefits of using the United States. And we'll get to that a little bit in, in, in a little bit. Um, another scenario that comes up frequently are family members immigrating to the U.S. So family members wanting to be in the U.S. on a permanent basis or, or certainly on a basis that would cause them to be fully income tax um, resident here in the United States. So basically pre-immigration planning. What can we do for these clients before they come to the U.S., before they get a green card to minimize the amount of U.S. tax, of U.S. tax that's going to be exposed to their assets? So that's an, that's an important one as well. Um, and then second, yeah, the fourth one is direct investment in the US. So basically invest people who want to invest in the US and um, you know, how do we structure their investments in a way, so they're not spending time in the US, but how do we structure their investments in a way that we block estate and gift tax, which is you know, vitally important for the reasons we discussed earlier but also make the structure efficient from an income tax perspective. So we don't solve their estate and gift tax exposure, but then put them in some kind of structure that's just horrendous from an income tax perspective here in the US where they're paying a ton of US income tax. So those are, those are important considerations for those clients. So I'm gonna go briefly on, on the next couple of slides. So in addition to those four scenarios, I also see a, 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 what we're seeing a lot of lately is, you know, what, what I'll call using the U.S. to, you know, quote unquote, institutionalize the family. So basically put in an institutional like structure, like a fun type structure around a family to really make the family um, have sophisticated, um, sophisticated and tailored approach to wealth succession to um, governance, you know, governing family assets um, once the patriarch or matriarch passes away, and then asset protection, and then just structuring vis-a-vis, -vis, um, you know, investments vis-a-vis -vis other family members or maybe third parties. And so when we approach a family who's interested in that type of planning, um, we often look at, as a, at a U.S. trust as kind of the top level family structuring vehicle. So the trust will be the wealth succession and preservation vehicle. It will it will dictate the founders um, the, the founders wishes as far as how assets will be distributed after death, um, how how businesses and how assets will be kept and held after death, how they'll be operated. You know what will be kept, what will be divested. You know things of that nature. And designed to you know the trust is designed to do that over you know multiple generations. So to have you know generational transfers of, of income and family assets, um, hopefully in perpetuity. So let's go to the next slide. And so in addition to, you know, when we institutionalize a family using the trust as kind of the top level um, vehicle for the wealth, wealth succession, wealth transfer, and effectuating the founder's um, wishes as far as those issues, 
um, we often use underlying companies underneath the trust for our tax um, asset protection purposes and for flexibility. And so we will hold assets depending on what they are in various underlying companies. Certainly if we're using the US, we're likely gonna use limited liability companies, but because many of my clients are global, the structures will also have Cayman companies, um, Guernsey companies, Jersey companies, just depending upon where the, at, where the family assets are located and, and where um, and the type of income that's, that's coming out of the um, individual asset. And so we'll use underlying companies um, to basically accomplish those goals. Segregate assets, protect assets from liabilities, um, the liabilities that might, that might um, be generated in one of the assets, protect from the, you know, the other assets from those liabilities. And so that's another important thing. So, so I think at the end of the day, if you look at a lot of my clients, probably my, my largest clients, if you look at their structures, and they, they're going towards more of an institutional model. And if you looked at their structures, what you'd see are a series of, you know, one or more trusts at the top of their, of their structure, which deal with wealth succession, you know, using US law concepts for wealth succession, for, for asset protection, and for governance. Um, and then below that, uh, below the trust, you, you would see structures that very much look like a private equity structure. Um, so various companies holding investments, whether they be liquid investments, whether they be real estate, whether they be brick and mortar, direct investing, um, maybe foundations, so if there's charitable, um, if there's a charitable aspect of the planning. Um, but it would very much look like a, a, a institutional um, structure. So in the next slide, um, just talking, we talked a bit about U.S. trust, but I want to touch on a couple more concepts, um, and, and we'll flush these out in the next couple of slides where I have structures. Um, the fact, trust established under U.S. law have become more desirable for non-U.S. persons, um, really, I think, for a couple reasons. One is, I think that the world's recognized that you know, trust law in the US is fairly well developed. We have states and, and trust laws in the United States are the product of the individual states. So each state has its own trust law. In some states, practitioners like me look to, I look to certain states um, more favorably than others when I, when I set up trust. Um, I'm generally looking at Delaware, South Dakota, uh, Wyoming, Nevada, there's a few others, but basically looking for jurisdictions that have very flexible trust laws, have um, courts that respect trust to understand what trusts are, and have case law that provides some kind of certainty as result, a certainty, certainty of result if there were to be litigation involving the trust. So for that reason, um, I think trust under, established under U.S. law have been more popular. I think um, the asset protection benefits of the United States um, being, you know, the protection of the jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis other countries and other you know, potential creditors. And then thirdly, I think the privacy aspects of using the United States. Um, I didn't put it in here, but certainly the fact that um, certainly the fact that the United States is in a signatory to CRS currently, um, I think for clients of mine that are in um, countries where there is a minimal or no rule of law and there are safety issues, um, they've looked to the United States to set up their structures. Uh, of course, they need to be um, they need to be compliant, tax compliant in their home jurisdiction. But if they if they do that, um, they they do look to the U.S. as a place where they can maintain privacy in respect of their assets. I think that the U.S. is one of the few jurisdictions in the world where I think that if you looked at most members of the public, they think that the wealth, they, they, their belief is that the wealthy have a right to maintain privacy in respect of their wealth. And if and if they don't want to tell the world what they own, then you know the rest of the world doesn't have the right to know what they own. Um, so long as they're complying with the law and paying taxes and doing the things they're supposed to do. Um, and so for those reasons, I think trust in U.S. structures have become more popular. And I think the other way, reason more and more clients are understanding that we can set up U.S. structures in a way that um, we can set up a U.S. trust in a, in a way that's a U.S. trust. It gains all the protections of a U.S. trust under U.S. law, the asset protection, the wealth protection. Um, but we can do it in a way that's very tax efficient because the way that trusts operate here in the United States, um, the default is for tax purposes, it's almost like the default is that the trust, even though it's settled in Delaware or South Dakota, the, the default very much is that trust is a foreign trust 
for tax purposes, meaning that um, the gains um, generated within that trust structure, unless they're US source, unless it's US business or US securities that are generating dividends, you know, things that would have been taxed in the US otherwise, but if you have a U.S. trust that's a foreign taxpayer holding a factory in China, that U.S. trust does not cause that the income um, generated by that Chinese, Chinese factory to be picked up in the U.S. So basically, you can be a foreign taxpayer um, and have all the benefits of being a foreign taxpayer, but yet have all the benefits also of having a U.S. trust. So that planning, I think, is very important for um, foreign families who um, you know, clearly don't want to use a U.S. trust and have all their global assets pulled in immediately into the uh, US uh, income tax net. So here's a simple trust structure. Um, so in this chart, you've got a Russia, Russian high, ultra high net worth settlor uh, who settles assets, cash into a US law trust, what, let's call it Delaware. Um, that trust has beneficiaries. Those beneficiaries can be Russian, they can be American, they can be wherever in the world. Um, Note that the U.S. law trust is a foreign taxpayer. So this is exactly what I was talking about um, before. That is that that trust has, um, it has been structured in a manner that um, it's a foreign taxpayer for U.S. income tax purposes. So any assets held in that trust, unless they would otherwise generate U.S. source income, like an active trader business sitting here in the U.S., or stocks and bonds that throw off interest and in, in dividends, um, that would be subject to with, withholding taxes, there would be no additional um, income tax exposure in the U.S. to any of the other assets. So it's very important. And then the trustee, um, and we can get to the trustee in a second, the trustee here has a, have as a private trust company or a commercial trustee. So the advantage of this structure, your trust fosters privacy because the trust is a very private arrangement. There's nothing, um, there's nothing disclosed publicly related to the trust. It provides seamless transfer of assets at death. Um, it can impose family governance mechanisms. You get the protection and stability of the U.S. trust law and courts for asset protection. And then again, because it constitutes a foreign trust for income tax purposes, your U.S. income tax exposure is limited to U.S. source income and a U.S. source active income and U.S. source passive income. So basically, the stuff that would have been taxed in the U.S. otherwise. Um, qu quick, quick one on private trust companies. So. A lot of clients, when they set up structures like this, are looking to the U.S. Uh, to set up trust structures or have you know, trust structures with underlying companies underneath them. Um, rightfully, are worried about control. They, they they don't want to lose control over their assets, and so a private trust company is a vehicle here in the U.S. that we can use to give uh, families some control over the trust. And really, I mean, once they have the control over the trust, they have control over the assets um, settled into the trust. And so what a private trust company is, it's a company whose sole purpose is to act as a trustee in respect of a trust or group of trusts. So it's a trustee, but it's a private trustee. Um, and, and that tr private trustee only acts as trustee for a trust for a particular family. So it's a, it, it is only acting as trustee for a particular family's trust. Um, and so these can be set up, certain states provide for private trust company laws um, the best ones that usually I look to when I'm setting these up for families are Nevada, South Dakota, and Wyoming. And the reason is, is that the, those jurisdictions have a very light regulatory touch um, over trustees, uh, uh, trustees. So usually in the states, if you want to operate a trust company, it's highly regulated by the, by the state. Capital requirements, disclosures that are public. Um, but for private trust companies in the right states, um, the regulatory burden on these private trust companies is very low. Um, you can maintain privacy, the operational costs are very low, and we can have the benefits of a trust com of, a, of a private trust company, meaning that we can have a board of directors of that private trust company made up by the fam of family members that basically can vote as a board to control trust um, decisions and like things like distributions, investments, um, things like that. So. PTCs, we call them PTCs, have become very popular um, for foreign families. And so the next structure chart, which I have up now, just shows you the same, the same structure we've been discussing with a U.S. private trust company as trustee. So again, extremely private if it's formed in a jurisdiction with a light regulatory touch. And then that, that trust company, because family members can serve on the board, 
allows the family to have control over the assets in the trust and allows them to participate in, in decision making. Um, we'll go and I'm going to skip asset protection planning just because of time and the fact that um, we've talked a bit about it. I think the, the bottom line is, is that the U.S. is an attractive jurisdiction for asset protection um, given its power in the global landscape um, and its adherence to rule of law and the fact that we have um, well-developed and long-standing vehicles to protect family assets like limited liability companies, like trusts like corporations, like certain types of partnerships. And so we can use those types of vehicles in connection with, um, with a trust to pro provide further protection um, of family assets. So in this structure, which is uh, slide 16, this shows a um, what I call domestic asset protection trust. This is the exact same structure we've been talking about except that this is a, what we call a self-settled um, asset protecting trust. So you've got a settler, and here I've got a Russian ultra high net worth settler, um, puts money into a domestic asset protection trust. So let's say $100 million, and, but also is a beneficiary of that trust. So the, the settler can still benefit from that $100 million, still can get distributions, um, but the trust has to be irrevocable. So basically, once the settler puts that money into the trust, it, it, it's forever. And that's the asset protection benefit because if the settler could unwind it, it wouldn't operate as an asset protection vehicle. And then we would have a trustee, either a private trust company that the settler didn't control, or we would have a third party commercial trustee, service trustee, to basically protect the assets. So basically, this type of structure can be used by someone who has real creditors or real creditor risk or real claimants. Um, not currently, but you could foresee them in the future. Um, this can be used to protect assets in the U.S. in a manner that um, the settler can still benefit from um, the assets that he or she um, acquired. And this next one, I skipped the the LLC the LLC discussion just in a matter of time. In a matter of time, um, this is the same structure, only using a limited liability company underneath the trust. And again, this is something we do all the time to kind of segregate assets for, for asset protection and liability protection purposes. So basically, you could have a number of limited liability companies, and so long as they're administered correctly, um, a liability that exploded in one, say a lawsuit or, uh, or whatever, um, would be limited to that, li that limited liability company and the assets within it, whereby your other limited liability companies that held other family assets would be shielded. So using limited liability companies, using foreign entities like Cayman companies or Jer uh, Jersey or Guernsey companies also like in, in that manner will further the asset protection goals um, of a family. Um, I have another couple slides uh, that I'm kind of skip over in the matter, in a, in, in, just given the time, um, but, but you can read these over and, and happy to, you know, you've got my email address on the, on the cover of this um, presentation be happy to take questions, but you know, briefly, it's the we also have a tool called uh, private placement life insurance here in the United States, and a number of families are looking to life insurance as kind of another asset protection tool. And what you can do with PPLI is you can you can put family assets, cash, or in certain circumstances, um, assets other than cash, maybe securities, into a PPLI policy, fund it into a life insurance policy. Um, give the the the, pilot, the the life insurance company basic parameters as to how those proceeds are to be invested. Um, although the family can't control investment or it, will, it, it won't satisfy as PPLI, but give them parameters on how it's invested. And then once those assets are in that PPLI, PPI, PPLI policy, excuse me, um, they will not be subject to U.S. In income tax. So the, 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 the income will be generated free of U.S. income tax, so it's a huge gain. gain. And then two, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing asset protection vehicle because it's almost impossible for creditors um, or potential claimants to pierce the, um, the PPLI policy. So um, the structure chart on page 20 basically shows the use of a PPLI policy in an asset protection structure using a U.S. Um, domestic trust. Um, finally, just a quick um, 
we talked on about some of the tax concepts and in, in, uh, investing in the U.S. I just wanted to quickly go over some structuring um, for potential invest, investments in the U.S. Um, when a Russian client comes to me looking to invest in the U.S. through one of these structures, the U.S. structure or otherwise, um, and depending upon the asset, you know, we, we have we have a couple of uh, tax planning goals. One, we want to obviously want to minimize their exposure to income tax here in the U.S. We want to minimize or even better eliminate exposure to U.S. estate and gift taxes, you know, that 40 percent gross tax. And then we want to manage state tax and local law considerations. So I've been talking a lot about federal tax, but a lot of the states have also imposed their own income taxes that we want to manage. And then with those goals in mind, we have you know key considerations that we need to think about to kind of how we, you know, the questions, the answer, the question, the answer to these questions will dictate how we deal with our goals. So one is, you know, what is the underlying investment? Um, will the underlying investment generate income? Hopefully, yes. And if so, um, what kind of income? Um, and in that question, when I'm saying, will it generate um, income? Some, some assets won't. If it's personal use property, you know, the family's vacation home in New York, I mean, that's not something to be income producing. Um, and in that case, we're probably more worried about a state, you know, blocking exposure to state and gift tax than worrying about income tax. And then thirdly, what's the expected holding period of the investment? And so, this next slide kind of shows a structure that deals with some of these issues. Here I picked real estate. It could be a, a, you know, another asset class, but you've got a Russian investor who wants to acquire U.S. real estate. So how do we make this tax efficient? Well, in this instance, because corporate federal, uh, our federal corporate tax is only 21% right now, um, we gen generally look to a corporate structure. So basically income on that real estate is charged uh, tax at 21%. The problem, however, is um, we need this non-U.S. corporation um, at the top, and the purpose of that non-U.S. corporation is to block um, this investor's exposure to uh, U.S. federal uh, estate and gift tax. Um, if we don't have that, then when the Russian investor passes away, um, that he'll, he'll, he or she will either be holding a U.S. corporation, which is a U.S. situs asset for estate tax purposes, or real estate, which is a U.S. situs asset for estate tax purposes. Um, if he or she dies holding holding those assets through a non-U.S. corporation. At at that person's death, they 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 are holding stock in a foreign corporation, say Cayman, Jersey, Guernsey, which is not subject to U.S. Um, estate tax, um, irrespective of the fact that that BVI, um, Cayman, Guernsey, Jersey corporation holds beneath it U.S. situs assets. So that that non-U.S. corporation serves as a blocker. So it's very important. The problem, the only problem with, the, with from an income tax perspective, so, so that, that structure solves the estate and gift tax um, issue. The only problem is, is although our U.S. real estate, when it generates income, it's taxed at a low rate of 20, 21%. Um, when you dividend from the U.S. corporation to the, to the foreign corporation, there's a 30% withholding tax we talked about earlier. Um, that can be avoided, however, if you liquidate at the end of the project, um, you don't distribute um, income up period or dividends up periodically, just wait to liquidate the structure at the end, you can eliminate that 30% um, that tax and effectively pay a 21% um, income tax rate for, for life on the investment. So, um, so that's a really nice structure. Um, the second slide, the next slide, last slide, um, is the same exact slide, only it imposes a trust on top. And so this is basically taking our trust planning that we talked about a few minutes ago with this tax planning for investing in the United States and kind of wrapping it all together. And the, the income tax in the state and gift tax um, treatment is exactly the same as it was in the previous slide. Um, only in this structure, you get all the benefits of the US trust, um, the US trust structures that we talked about earlier. Um, so this is a really nice um, slide to kind of tie all the concepts together. So anyways, um, I think we're pretty far along. I, I got some time, some questions. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions, but I'd be happy to take them. Okay, I've got a few here, hold on. Yeah, so the question was, the, are the tax implications for Ukrainian and caste um, nationals different or the same for Russians? 
um, they will be the same. These concepts will be the same except for tax treaties. So to the extent that we can utilize tax treaties to lower withholding rates, um, for like uh, the withholding rates on dividends and interest, um, Russia, Russia has a um, tax treaty um, and we'd have to check for Ukraine and Kazakhstan. Um, but otherwise, these concepts apply equally across the board. Um, next question. Which criteria, which criteria will put a non-U.S. citizen in a position of a person domiciled in the U.S.? So domicile for, in the U.S. for purposes of estate and gift tax purposes depends upon um, being present, physically present in the United States, so be living here. And, but, but it's more than that. It's living here plus an intent, a subjective intent to permanently uh, live here. So it's, it's a very hard thing to prove. Um, now, obviously, if the IRS has some kind of like, emails or writing or, 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 or asks, your, asks someone's friends, you know, what was this person's intent? Were they really, you know, oh, this person was going to live here forever. You know, that, that would show um, domicile for U.S. estate and gift tax purposes. More, um, more practically, however, what the IRS would look for is, you know, where is this person's, where is the center of their vital activities? So yes, this person's living here, but where, where are their doctors? Where are they voting? Um, where are their friends? If, if all those people are in the U.S., the IRS is going to consider that person to be domiciled in the U.S., having that intent to permanently live here um, and then be subject to U.S. estate and gift tax liability on a worldwide basis. Um, and for income tax, it's much more objective, right? For income tax, we're talking about day count, monitoring days, uh, mo monitoring days. We're talking about we're talking about um, green card. Obviously, if this person's going to get a green card, you know, advising them before they get that green card and then citizenship. Um, next question: Would you say that today's U.S. tax system is more scrupulous when studying Russian nationals' worldwide income situation? Um, in their family close well, relatives' income? I'd say no. I, I don't think that Russian nationals are being picked out any more than any other, um, any other national or national. Um, it, it's not what I'm seeing in my practice, and, and I, I work for a fairly large group. Um, we have about 50 uh, private client lawyers at my firm, and I think my partners would feel similarly. Um, there's no doubt that under FAFCA and under um, some of the information exchange that's come in under FATCA, we're getting information, the IRS is getting information about foreign nationals um, having accounts here in the US um, through some, some of the information reporting. And there's just been a flood of those foreigns being coming into the IRS. And I think they're just now you know, going in some warehouse in you know, San Francisco, and they're just now figuring out ways to kind of extrapolate the data from these forms. And they're starting to do a lot of audits um, on people where they, where they see um, possible instances of um, uh, uh, of tax noncompliance. Like I have a client of mine who's Pakistani, who was American, he was American, um, that he had, a, there's a form 3520 where he was supposed to report some trusts and they didn't get filed in a couple of years. And uh, through this program, I think the IRS found out about it. And, you know, obviously we have opened up an audit. So I think basically they're equal opportunity at this point. I don't think there's any specific uh, focus on Russia or Russian nationals. Uh, the last question, um, what, what kind of money are we talking about when, we, when deciding to set up a trust so it makes sense? And U.S. lawyers would be happy to work with these sums. Level of minimal funds for setting up a trust in the U.S., a million, 10 million, uh, 50 million. So it depends. It depends. I, I think a million, probably too low. But maybe if there's asset protection issues, might make sense. Um, 10 million, certainly you could do it, 50 million easily. Um, the, the costs are, the cost obviously of legal documentation to set up the trusts, which is relatively straightforward. Um, the, co the cost would be dictated on whether that client wants a private trust company. If we need to set up a private trust company, there's gonna be additional cost um, to do that with the state. It's not a huge cost with the state, but there will be a cost. And then just the talking with the family and the discussion about what the private trust company could, should look like, succession of board members, um, who, who's going to sit on the board, decision making. 
and then or or whether they're going to use a commercial trustee like a um, an RBC, a City National, a, a Sequent, um, and those. So then you've got to consider the the expenses of the trust company and how much they're going to charge to administer the the, the trust. And so um, I think it just depends on what the family wants. I think you can do it on a relatively um, efficient basis. It well, the efficiency that is driven by the types of assets and the complexity of the assets and the sheer number of assets or value of assets you're putting in the structures. Um, but the, the cost can depend upon what the family wants. But I think millions a little tough. Like I said, 10, I think it's doable. Um, and then 50 is definitely doable. But it all comes down to kind of the bells and whistles that the family wants and what we want to build into the structures. So I think that's my last question. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all today and I um, hope that wasn't too much information in a short period of time. Um, my, you have my contact information, my email, my phone numbers. Feels, please feel free to reach out if you have questions, or you wanna follow up on anything. Um, working from home right now for the for foreseeable future, but uh, business as usual otherwise. And, uh, and I do come to Moscow, I was there in October, uh, October and I'm planning, I was planning to come back um, next couple months. We'll see how the travel um, restrictions play out, but I definitely plan to be back in Moscow sometime this year and um, would love to meet, meet folks that um, might be interested in this type of uh, planning. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it.